Hello everybody! Well, it is now time to look at the Star Trek movies and I apologize, I was gonna do, I was gonna start this whole thing yesterday but I just didn't have enough time. Um, I was gonna do them sometime last night but I was at Easter dinner at a friend's house last night so yeah, I, that's why I couldn't do the start doing the reviews last night, but I'm going to start doing the reviews today. I'm going to start with the first one and then um, I'll have more time hopefully on Wednesday and I'll have a bunch of time on the weekend in order to get the other films done and stuff. So here we go. So let's start off with Star Trek the Motion Picture. Yeah. And yes, I have the director's cut of the movie, which is actually the second version of the movie that I've seen. There's, of course, the 1979 theatrical version. There's the VHS version, which I have seen. Uh, my dad has it, so that's how I was able to see that version. And then there's the director's cut. And um, I'm going to tell you, this movie, it, it definitely gets a rap for being just way too long, way too slow. And a lot of people compare it to 2001 Space Odyssey, which, by the way, I have seen. Um, it was on TV one time when I watched it, and I was like, God. Now I see why people are comparing this to Star Trek The Motion Picture, you know? But really, people compare Star Trek The Motion Picture to 2001, so there we go. Um, but yes, and I will be doing some film factoids. I'm going to be reading... Uh, Pretty much all the film factoids off of imdb.com, so there we go. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Huh. So anywho, basic plot of Star Trek The Motion Picture is, or I guess a, or well, I guess, I don't know if you could call it plot per se, but it's just less stuff, it's just something that happens in the movie and stuff like that, so. And your basic plot of Star Trek The Motion Picture is that there's this anomaly heading toward Earth and um, Kirk then gets to take command of the Enterprise once again to find out what the anomaly is and why it's heading toward Earth and all that stuff. And, uh, and we get when we see the new Enterprise in this movie, it looks fantastic. Um, the score was done by the always awesome late Jerry Goldsmith who did the score for the first Alien movie and... Uh, he also did the score for Star Trek V, as well as, uh, you know, First Contact through Nemesis, and kudos to him. And, but yeah, he's done a lot of stuff. He also did the score for the Disney animated movie Mulan, which I applaud him for. Yay. And he's just done so much over his, ex over his career. It's just amazing, really. And of course he did... The opening theme for Voyager and he also scored the final episode for Voyager which was awesome so yeah um but yeah anywho um but of course this is a totally new enterprise and there's lots of stuff going on like there's the transporter accident scene which is just so really chilling and and you don't really expect that kind of stuff to happen in a Star Trek movie but let's face it We've had transporter accidents before, okay? Seriously. These kinds of things that happen, but have happened before, and they'll continue to happen, so let's just face the facts, people. Transporter accidents are nothing new in Star Trek. That's all. Okay. But yeah, and also the introductions of some of the characters are really good, especially when we see Kirk for the first time in San Francisco. It's just amazing. And uh, the introduction of Spock on Vulcan was was a very good scene, and I like the the way the Vulcan looks in the director's cut rather than in the original version. Because you know, in the original version, you know, when we see the we see Planet Vulcan, we see like a star field that looks like some moons and stuff like that. I was like, wait a minute, did they say in one of the episodes that there aren't supposed to be any moons? That Vulcan is not supposed to have any moons? What the hell? But thankfully they changed around the director's cut. That was, that was good. I like that addition. And uh, the introduction of Bones was just weird. I mean, he gets transported onto the Enterprise and he has this, like, beard that makes him look like Grizzly Adams and stuff like that. I'm like, really? What the hell? But again, you know, it's because 
time has passed since the original series and all that stuff, so that's probably why Bones looked like that in the movie. So, yeah. But anywho, then, the, then there was, of course, the scene where Kirk orders the ship to go to warp drive in the solar system, and doesn't really work all that well, does it? But thankfully, later on, Spock comes aboard and fixes everything up, so that way the Enterprise can go and find out what the anomaly is. And, uh, and of course, I should mention the fact that there are a couple new characters introduced, including uh, Decker, played by Stephen Collins, who you guys might know from Seventh Heaven. And there's also Lieutenant Ilya, played by Persis Kambada, and um, I'll get more into their characters later on in the film factoids section of the review. Um, so anywho, the ship, so anywho, the Enterprise goes and to find out more about the anomaly, which later on turns, is called V'ger, and then near the end of the movie, we find out it's the Voyager 6 probe uh, that was launched by NASA years and years ago, and I came across a planet dominated by living machines. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, the machine, the living machines, designed the ship so that way Vidra could travel back home to Earth and transmit all of its data to its creator. But hey, guess what? We ain't got NASA no more in the in the twenty third century. You got the United Federation of Planets and Starfleet and all that stuff. So really, what's the point having NASA around anymore? Hmm. But anyway, so then Decker then keys in the final sequence, then joins up with V'ger and and this and we see the beginning of this new of a new life form and stuff like that. Of course, we never see Decker or Ilya again. They're never even they're not even mentioned anymore in Star Trek, so that kind of sucks. I mean, I really wanted Decker to come back, but oh well, what can you say? <laughs> so that's basically the general overall plot of Star Trek: The Motion Picture. I know I wasn't going to go too much into the movie, but, you know, there are some things I really liked about it, like, uh, like seeing the Klingons and their new look, that was fun, um, you know, they look different than they did in the original series, of course, that was because of budgetary reasons, obviously, so that's why the Klingons look different than they, than when they did in the original series, and of course the movie was directed by Robert Wise, who directed my all-time favorite movie, Sound of Music. That's right. The director of Sound of Music also directed Star Trek The Motion Picture. Where does that happening? Huh? Okay, well, time for the film factoid section of the review. Okay. Let's... Okay, here we go. Yeah, wait a minute. Okay, there we go. Well, according to IMDb here, it says that Viewing this box, my love, V'ger. <sighs> Hold on a minute, guys. Huh? Yeah. <sighs> Hold on.
sorry about that guys, my stepdad just needs to talk to me about something. I'm like, really? I'm trying to make a YouTube video here. It's like, ugh. She can only focus on one thing at a time. That nerd. Okay, now where was I? Oh yeah. So, back to film factories. Okay. During Xbox One, we would feature frame by frame shows images of Klingons, Ilya, Episode 9, and Voyager 6 Pro. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, also, Paramount then announced that they were creating a new TV network, initially operating one in a week, showing Paramount TV movies and a new Star Trek series about the Enterprise's second five year mission, with most of the original cast, and the title Star Trek Phase 2. It soon became clear that they could not make a go of the new network, but Paramount continued work on the new series in the hope of selling it to one of the existing networks. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Also, the film's plot about the NASA pro Voyager, Viger, returning to Earth to look for its crater was very similar to a 1967 episode of the original Star Trek series entitled The Changing, in which a NASA space probe, Nomad, was found in space by an Enterprise crew. The probe had been made vastly more powerful by an encounter with an alien probe and the two merged into one, and it went to fire incredibly powerful energy bolts at targets in its path as it attempted to sail these imperfect biological infestations, i.e. all living creatures including people, but had difficulty accepting that humans were its creator. <coughs> so the story was adapted again in the 1970s by Gene Roddenberry for an unproduced TV series of, <coughs> of his called Genesis 2, an episode called Robots Return. This was then rewritten as a Star Trek script by Alan Dean Foster under the title In Thy Image and proposed as the two hour premiere pilot of Star Trek Phase 2, a planned Star Trek TV series that actually started production in 1977. However, Paramount decided to abandon the idea in favor for another TV series and make a Star Trek film instead. The series adapted for, well, Star Trek the Motion Picture. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the decision was made in 1977. But in order to keep the team together during the necessary renegotiation contracts, Paramount kept it secret until March 1978. When Rana Barrett broke the secret in 1977, they denied it. Meanwhile, they pretended that the TV series was still going to happen, even soliciting scripts for episodes that would never be made. Sets built for the TV series were used in the movie, but model work had to be redone after the change was made public due to the need for a finer detail in the movie. Now that makes sense. Director Robert L. Collins, whose background was in television, was hired to direct the two-hour work premiere, but after the change to movie, Paramount had wanted a more experienced director and replaced him with, well, Robert Wise. So there we go. Okay. Gene Roddenberry wanted Al Jean Foster to write the final script for the film, but Harold Livingston thought him too inexperienced and tried to hire Stephen Bacco, who was unavailable. <coughs> Michael Simino, who wasn't interested, and Bill L. Norton, who initially accepted but found it beyond its capabilities. In the end, Livingston did the job himself. He disagreed repeatedly with, Rob with Roddenberry over rewrites and other matters and quit and returned several times. Wow. Okay. The TV series was to have three new regular characters. Paramount was concerned that William Shatner might ask for too much money to continue playing Kirk if the run of the series was extended beyond the initial order of 13 episodes. Wow, 13 episodes? Huh. The character of Decker was created so that Kirk had to be written out. Decker would, could become the new series' new lead role. Decker was played in a movie by, of course, Stephen Collins. Leonard Nimoy declined to return to Spock for the series, so a new Vulcan character called Lieutenant Zong was created to be the new science officer. An employee, an employee of an agent was dating a, a young actor, David Gutro, who had no agent of his own. She suggested him for the part, and he got it, and was told it was actually for a movie. When Nimue finally agreed to do the movie, Spock replaced Zahn's the script, and Gutro was given the smaller part of Commander Branch, who of course was in command of Epsilon 9, so huh, we'll have him in the end. The, continue, the, <clears throat> the character of Lieutenant Ilea, played by Persis Kambada, was also intended as a continuing role in the TV series. Hmm. The original version of the Spacewalk Sukas had both Spock and Kirk traveling through V'ger because it was 
complicated because it complicated the flow of the film. The sequence reshot was Spock alone as we're seeing the final cut. However, a fraction of this alternate scene remains in a longer version. Kirk says, I have him in sight. The V'ger prop was so large and involved so much work that one end of it was being used in scenes while the other one was still being built. Hmm, that's interesting. The scene where Kirk addresses the crew prior to launching, much of the crew were extras who were noted Star Trek fans, including Joe Tremble, co-organizer of the letter writing campaign that kept the original Star Trek alive for a third season. Ooh. It was understood in the script, but not in the film, that Commander Willard Decker was son of Commodore Matthew Decker, half crazy starship captain who committed suicide in the original series episode, The Doomsday Machine. During Christmas, Academy Award nominated score featured a special musical instrument called the Blaster Beam, an instrument 15 feet long, incorporating artillery shell casings and motorized magnets. Huh, that's interesting. It was used as any part of any scene featuring V'ger. Oh, excuse me. The instrument was invented by former child star to new age musician Craig Hundley, who, in his youth, had portrayed Captain Kirk's nephew Peter Kirk in the Star Trek episode Operation Annihilate. He also appeared in another episode as Tommy Starnes in And the Children Shall Lead. G. Renneberry <clears throat> so loved the main theme from the score he reused it for Star Trek Next Generation. Well, that's obvious. And again, guys, I'm reading all the film factoids here, so that's why this video is probably going to be a little longer than usual, but oh well, what the hell. The voice of actress Majel Barrett, who played Dr. Christine Chappell, so those other roles, you know, like Fox Hunt Troy of uh, Next Generation, obviously. And was Gene Roddenberry's wife, is used for Starfleet computers as of that of the Enterprise throughout the Star Trek franchise, from the original series through to the Star Trek reimagining. Her voice in this picture is very recognizable, though she does not have a lot of lines. Which is true, by the way. Eh. Because of the need to rebuild sets and models when the production switched from a television series to a big budget feature film, the production was already 10 weeks behind schedule before a single frame was shot. <laughs> wow. Director Robert Wise repeatedly considered quitting the production, and at one point even suggested that Paramount cancel a project altogether? Yeesh. Wow. Thank God that didn't happen. Robert Wise was convinced to accept the position as directed by his wife, who was a huge fan of the original Star Trek TV series. His wife was also in instrumental in convincing Wise to campaign for Leonard Nimoy's return to the project. Hmm, that's interesting. Prior to production, Gene Roddenberry joked that he wanted Richard Burnham for the role of Kirk and Robert Redford to play Spock. <laughs> the joke was reported as fact by some media. The role of Decker wasn't cast until days before production started. Actors considered included Andrew Robinson, who later played Garrick on Star Trek The U Space Nine, Jordan Clark, Richard Kelton, Lance Henriksen, Tim Thomerson, Stephen Mott, R. Tyndall, and Frederick Forrest. Huh. Okay, this is the one we're, we're getting into here. Okay. But the film marked the first this film marked the first appearance of the Ridge the ridged four headed Klingons. In the original T V series, G. Renneberry wanted the Klingons to look alien. But budget constraints prevented this from being done beyond giving the actors dark makeup and fake eyebrows. Hmm. The change of the Klingons' appearance was partially addressed in the DS9 episode Triples and Tri Triples uh, Trials and Tribulations, establishing the existence of smooth forehead Klingons. However, the ridged forehead Klingons appeared in the prequel series Star Trek Enterprise, prompting a satisfactory explanation to the brief existence of smooth forehead Klingons. The episodes Affliction and Divergence show their existence resulted from a viral mutation caused by Klingon experimentation with enhanced human DNA. Oh, interesting. Okay. The original series TV theme by Alexander Kirch came period briefly during Kirk's log entry after Spock rejoins the crew. It was heard during two more captain's log dictations. Except for the opening fanfare, which I became, which became a regular part of later Trek films, and a small episode heard at the end of Star Trek III: The Search for Spock, and a significant reference toward the end <coughs> of Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home, this is the only time in the film that the that the television theme is heard in a major fashion. <coughs> okay, 
Marcy Lafferty, who plays DeFalco, is married to William Shatner at the time. Oh, he's a good one. In the DVD making of the documentary, William, William Shatner says that at the time they were filming, there was no clear end to the film, and that the writers were constantly rewriting the ending. He recalls that at one point he came up with what he considered a good ending and pushed it to co star Leonard Nimoy, who thought it was a good idea. They went, they then went together to Robert Wise to pitch the idea to him. And of course, he also liked the idea. Now Shatner had to pitch it to Gene Roddenberry. Shatner claims that by the time he pitched the ending to Roddenberry, he was so exhausted from mustering up the energy to pitch the idea. In addition to the energy he used to work on the film, this pitch didn't go over so well and Roddenberry rejected it. In his book, Star Trek Movie Memoirs, Shatner recalls the story differently. The scene in question is the one in which the Enterprise crew starts to leave the bridge and they show how the Alia slash probe it is acting like a little child. When Roddenberry rejected it, Barbara Wise got Harold Livingston to write the scene instead. Hmm. Okay. James Duhon's twin sons, Montgomery and Christopher Duhon, appear as extras in the movie. The horse communications earpieces are the only original props from the original show. They were dug out of storage and realized someone had forgotten to make new ones from the movie. Whoopsies! Princess Kambata became very emotional about having her head shaved for her role. She kept her shorn hair in a box for a time and asked Jim Roddenberry to take it out and sure in case her hair didn't grow back. It did. Mm. The Klingon words spoken by the, sh by the Klingon ship ship's captain were actually invented by James Duhon. Later, linguist Mark O'Kran devised grammar and syntax rules of language along with more vocabulary words in Star Trek III and were to cling on dictionary. Well, that's obvious. All the extras in the Rec Deck briefing sequence were Star Trek fans called upon to appear in the film. Most of the checks were not cashed. Harv Bennett said that they were probably framed as souvenirs by the fans. Wow. Okay. And you know what? I'm not going to read the other ones. Those are just the ones I found very interesting. So, yeah, that was like 77. Now, I'm not going to read all 77 of those factoids. But, yeah, I'll probably look at, like, but for some factoids, I'll probably look at the first, like, 10 or 15 or something like that. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for now. Uh, once yeah, I'll be looking at Wrath of Khan, and then I'll be going on from there. So, talk to you guys later. Peace out. Bye.